Okay, so actually, uh, in, uh, in this session related to the um, uh, work package four work, which is mostly on users and applications, we actually wanted to want to have a, a, a set of um, presentations from uh, task leaders. What we are doing, uh, what we're doing in WP4 is actually to uh, address <clears throat> several application areas where uh, we want uh, we want to see, and our users also want to see, and, are, uh, and we're eager to offer them the progress uh, by integrating interesting things into Sync and Share. As you know, as those of you who operate the Sync and Share uh, platforms uh, are aware and experienced, uh, the the basic Sync and Share uh, stuff work workflow. Uh, I mean, the basic functionality is only the beginning of the game. So, in fact, if you have if you have um, uh, sync and share users, they're 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 very uh, very early. Will knock your doors asking if they can have some functionality, which they heard about, for instance, during the CS spree conferences or or, or events like that, or, just, or or they just know that they need it. And uh, our aim in uh, in the project in general, but WP4 is uh, 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 let's say assigned to uh, make it possible is to integrate several core applications which we which we identified at the level of the proposal preparation uh, i will show this list as, in, in a minute and uh, we um, we carefully selected these applications so that they are from one hand um, they're like possible to integrate at the level of the development we are and also having into account uh, taking into account that federation itself is still being created and uh, we're trying to understand what are the kind of possibilities and limits of the of the of the uh, federation uh, uh, platform and technology itself. On the other hand, we wanted uh, really uh, offer the user the added value. We are like uh, aware that uh, we're sitting in uh, on on one side of the let's say product and services market. This is um, actually on-premise uh, part of market where we are offering the users uh, the, the resources and services which are based on our own infrastructure and this is this really <clears throat> this is really important aspect uh, to, to be taken into account because on the other hand we see the um, pressure of um, big cloud providers uh, like uh, approaching our users but also uh, and also just users flowing away from our infrastructure to the infrastructure of uh, and cloud services of these providers. And one of the very important buying factors for the uh, public cloud stuff is the, is the extensive functionality people get there. Like for instance, if you have a sync and share service such as a Dropbox, uh, an added value, obvious added value is that you can edit the documents online. And this is actually exactly a kind of the example of the uh, application we are working on uh, we want to provide such kind of application uh, on our on-premise services so that we can not to say compete uh, because we will never compete with this uh, this kind of providers so not also really uh, our aim but we should make the offer as uh, comprehensive as possible and we identify these core applications which we find are very basic uh, and important in our environment and for our users so uh, what, what are important aspects that we are not hanging in air in WP4 and we we're using already for the integration of the functionality we're trying to use the uh, already existing size and the functionality and applications which are already run there and that was uh, and as it was all also mentioned in during the discussion uh, uh, on the uh, WP4 session uh, led by Ron uh, we also not starting from scratch. Uh, if, in fact, the sites uh, participating in WP4, but in uh, EOS, um, uh, CS3 mesh for EOS in general, they are uh, running the services since uh, some time. And what we're doing is trying to extend the um, extend the uh, functionality. On one hand, this is one stream of work, so we're improving the services themselves. Uh, and on the other hand, we're trying to integrate uh, these services with the mesh and providing the added value which is for instance uh, collaborative editing of documents which are uh, stored in more than one site of the mesh and the uh, audience and let's say the target audience of our work is actually uh, 
of course, we are R and D project, so researchers are in our. Uh, we are kind of researcher centric, but we also and a good example of that is the uh, is the uh, first presentation which will be provided by Marcin, and we're also providing uh, trying to provide let's say some kind of uh, usual daily use applications such as uh, collaborative documents editing, which is the topic of the third uh, presentation. So uh, uh, that would be uh, actually, th this I hope gives some kind of picture and background for what we're doing. And uh, uh, on, the practical, on the practical side, we've got uh, four tasks assigned, each task per uh, a main topic and application. We will be not uh, speaking about tasks too much uh, today, but we will be speaking about the application areas where we try to do progress in two areas which I mentioned. So first of all, once again, to repeat it, to improve the, for instance, the distributed data science env environments, we, we try to distribute, uh, we try to improve the level of, um, see the functionality of what you're offering locally, but uh, in, in parallel, and maybe first of all, we're working on enabling the um, collaborative, uh, collaborative work in these areas. So we have four areas, distributed data science environments. This will be presented by Marcin, open data systems. This will be presented by Guido and Marco. Uh, collaborative documents. This will be presented by Holger. And on-demand data transfers will be presented by Ron. So uh, yeah, that would be my, uh, my introduction. Uh, so um, now uh, I would uh, like to ask speakers to, uh, I will unshare my screen and uh, share the screens. Alternatively, I can also share the screen with the slides if you like. So Martin. A quick question, Martin, for the sake of um, um, process, how many minutes do we have per task? Uh, we assume five minutes. Uh, let's, just try to, let's try to stick to that. Of course, if we have a demo, we will have a demo. Uh, yeah, thank you. In, yes. two cases, in two cases, uh, open data systems and on-demand data transfers. One one uh, comment is that it's not that we we cannot show the demos of the other um, parts, but it will be it will it would it would take the whole full day, as Kuba uh, said, if we if we show everything. So just for you to see what's happening, we see 4.2 demo. So of course, 4.2 has assigned more time. Thank and you. on demand data transfers, where we of course assume some time will be consumed by the demo. So ready? Uh, okay, Martin, should I keep your uh, show yours? Okay, Kuba. Come on. So, uh, because uh, I'm looking at the timetable, I think uh, perhaps it would be good that we do a coffee break at some point. Uh, from what we foresaw in the program, initially we have time until quarter past uh, 12, so it's still mm -hmm. nearly one hour and a half. Uh, so I suppose that you can uh, perhaps, maybe we can do a first demo now, or the first uh, distributed data science environments, then perhaps we can go for a short coffee break. And then do the open data system demo. Yeah. Yeah? And then you can continue with uh, with the others, and then maybe we'll do a, you know, maybe then we'll have some time at the end also to have some free discussion about uh, about what you have presented in this, or maybe in general, like we had after the WP two presentation from Ron. Uh, but Kuba, uh, shall we stop? I mean, have the coffee break before the open data systems demo or after? I, I think after would help. Uh, Mark after, 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 after my Mark demo people are in the water, Australian water, time water. zone, please. Thank you. Table time. Yeah, sorry, excuse me, I forgot about. The Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So, so uh, then, uh, in that case, uh, Martin, should I show your slides, or you will show them uh, yourself? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll show them. Uh, okay, so I'm, not, I'm stopping sharing. Okay. Where is it? Okay. Can you see my slides? Okay. Yes. yes. Mm, okay. So obviously, uh, creating a mesh for for uh, open science couldn't go without without distributed data science environment. Uh, and Jupyter Notebook became the facto standard, not only in science, but also in uh, business intelligence and AI uh, in commercial projects. 
um, and in in this uh, in this uh, ecosystem there are a number of there are various tools uh, uh, that are used um you could you could see jupiter in action in david's presentation uh, with jupiter in uh, earth observations uh, use case uh, here i wanted to uh, to focus more on the distributed uh, part so basically uh, we just needed to connect uh, jupiter to uh, iop with the cs3 api so it it, it becomes uh, uh, a middleware for for Jupiter, and we uh, created um, in this uh, di distributed data science environments. We uh, develop uh, Jupiter Lab extension, which which does that. Uh, uh, the idea is uh, that uh, that we have full client in Jupiter Lab uh, for uh, CS3. Uh, uh, so uh, the extension uh, replaces uh, the default file browser. So there are some uh, additional functionalities for sharing. So you can see uh, the screenshot with uh, um, shared uh, with me, shared by me. Uh, you can see those uh, those uh, shares. Uh, uh, you can also share uh, within Jupyter Lab. So there are sharing buttons and entries in context menus. Uh, and there are uh, windows uh, with the uh, necessary information, uh, sharing status, uh, um, e e that uh, resources used, and and basically you have you have a file uh, browsing in that because we can also uh, share uh, uh, share uh, directories, uh, and uh, uh, for for the backend part, uh, this uh, extension replaces. Uh, uh, contents manager and, uh, and uh, checkpoints. So, so uh, here you see that uh, we uh, create uh, REST uh, endpoints for uh, for uh, Jupyter, so that the front end can have uh, uh, information about uh, uh, contents operations. Uh, also, checkpoints, which which actually is uh, is not done yet uh, for uh, for MVP, uh, and uh, of obviously share operations. Um, and uh, the uh, backend of, of the extension uh, connects uh, with uh, uh, CS3 APIs with uh, gRPC. Uh, and for, for this, we also um, generated and, and tested the, uh, the uh, client for uh, CS3 uh, for, for Python. Uh, so this this all is ready and, and work, but you should know that this is just work in progress. Uh, so we currently are working on user information. So so now you can share, but you need to have the uh, the ID of user. So so which is good for tests and uh, proof of concept. But obviously this is not perfect uh, user experience. Uh, so so now we are looking for uh, we we are working on on the uh, user lookups and and that that you can share by by user uh, name. Um, uh, also, in, in we are working on concurrent uh, updating for notebooks. So now this is uh, this uh, the, this is the most important uh, uh, functionality that is not uh, ready yet. Uh, we also need uh, some more stabilization tests. So we tested it. We know it works because this is these uh, basic tests are part of development, but we want to do some more testing with uh, multiple remote instances. And also there, there is some work on OCM uh, to, to be done. One thing that is on our uh, rather for next steps, uh, uh, which we hope to do very soon, is uh, Jupyter Lab 3, uh, which appeared uh, three weeks ago. Uh, uh, so um, uh, we we tried to to port to to uh, Jupyter Lab uh, three, uh, but there were some uh, problems with Webpack, so we we could not uh, build plugins. So we just decided to wait a little bit. But we 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 will uh, resume this uh, in a couple of weeks, and we target uh, Jupyter Lab uh, uh, three. Uh, and there is one one important thing that uh, that is missing that uh, while the um, uh, we can we can uh, connect with the uh, uh, IOP and uh, this uh, uh, all the all the 
things go to the uh, to the platform that we also need to mount the file system so that uh, the, the local uh, so, so we can we can access the the files from uh, from from uh, from the kernel uh, so for for now for the demos there was there was there was uh, there were some uh, uh, there were some workarounds uh, prepared uh, uh, prepared uh, so uh, for uh, for uh, next cloud uh, PSNC prepared a demo with with the workaround with synchronizing that uh, there are also workarounds for uh, for own cloud uh, and yes there's one thing that we uh, that this is uh, to be done with while we did that with this file browser uh, not all operations can be exchanged so so the uh, it works, but there are some unnecessary uh, uh, unnecessary um, uh, operations uh, that, that that are in the menus that that uh, that should be removed. To do that, we will need to uh, rewrite it and and completely remove the original uh, file uh, browser because now now it is uh, uh, it it uh, just can can do some mess. So definitely, this is not ready for trying it in your production. Uh, but the MVP is ready. It 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 works. You can you can check it uh, to and and give us some uh, some feedback. Uh, so we have accessing shared files and folders, sharing operations and information uh, on on the uh, on the sharing and uh, and status of this. Um, uh, so this this is uh, uh, our main uh, use cases. Case studies are with uh, uh, Earth operations with uh, JRC, and we'll also do some uh, extensive uh, tests uh, in uh, CERN for uh, high, um, high energy physics. Uh, also, PSNC uh, 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 includes this in their work, as you, you could you could hear, and we will try to use this in some uh, commercial uh, parts in our uh, data science projects and you are invited to uh, to start uh, being being part of of, of these uh, distributed data science environments uh, works and this is uh, all from me Okay, thank you, Martin. So now it's time for the uh, for the next uh, topic: uh, open data systems, uh, which will be presented by Guido and Marco. So Martin, if, Martin uh, could you unshare your? If screen? Martin could, yes. You you have to stop yeah. sharing. Martin. Ready. Yeah. <laughs> Clear. Okay. Thank you. Ready. Okay. All right. So, I I only have limited time and enormous amounts of things to say, but also a demo to run. So in this, in the interest of time, um, I'll say little and uh, reuse a slide by the Skibo RDS people. Thank you for uh, producing this slide. I have uh, uh, pilfered it and put a CS3.4 mesh logo on it, but it's really your slide. Uh, thank you for preparing it uh, and be choice about it. So um, task 4.2, open data systems, it comes out of the realization that a lot of our sites came at that while we started out around 2013 and 14, hosting transaction level um, ad hoc files, um, we ended up with people loving the service so much that they dumped their entire research data holdings on them and started uh, ingesting live data from their instruments into these data shares. And you get to the point where you realize that you have a duty of care and you're no longer just, you're talking about collections level data, but you, you really haven't facilitated collections level data management. So task 4.2 aims to remediate that. Task 4.2 is about providing collection level data tools to researchers uh, who want to interface with the outside world at the collections level. Um, beautifully, it manages to do so by not inventing the wheel itself, but by reusing packages and efforts that were underway already. I've mentioned uh, the Skibo IDS effort by the Munster University people. They are part of this project. Um, another component is the, the metadata editing package called Describo from UTS, um, who were contracted through Cottage Labs inside of this project. Um, most of the code editing around the, uh, the most of the code glue around all of this will be provided by the Aileron people. Martin, who 
which is presented. Um, and in the end, as, uh, as we have allowed people to create RO crates, annotate them, et cetera, um, then comes the point where it is expunged and interfaced with the outside world, um, repositories, archives, publishing entities, uh, web services like uh, Open Science Framework. Um, that is um, a collaborative effort between the SKU IDS people who write those plugins, the connections plugins, and at least one repository being um, as a nodo, who of course are a CERN project, and CERN is a project partner in this platform as well. So it starts on the on the left hand side. A user views uh, their file holdings inside of a, a mesh node, or perhaps even file holdings between different mesh nodes. Draws a virtual circle around those files that they want to define as a collection. Skibo uh, IDS um, figures out which files those are invokes Describo, Describo allows you to do the annotation, um, packages, packages the whole thing up as an RO crate. The RO crate is passed back to Skibo RDS. Skibo RDS um, interfaces again with the user, asks the user what particular external service to expunge this to, um, and then the interfacing between, say, Zenodo or Open Science Framework, or perhaps even Springer or uh, Elsevier, uh, as, as time progresses, will be a plugin. That's all I'm going to say about this. Um, the, the, the bit that people are least familiar with typically is how that whole metadata annotation stuff happens. And fortunately, Marco La Rosa, who wrote the Describo online package so far, is online to give us a demo about this stuff. Are you ready, uh, Marco? I am. I will unshare. Okay. No, not new share. This is, I am so adroit at these things. Stop share, precisely. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through um, actually creating an RO crate and sort of talk about the process and, and then show you a little bit of the data in the background. Um, and hopefully that will make things a little bit clearer. Now, I know we don't have a lot of time and I will try not to say too much and I'll try not to go too quickly. So bear with me. <clears throat> um, at UTS, this is the this is um, the Scribo online from UTS. So this is the the version that I built for UTS. Um, UTS has a policy which is um, says that researchers can put their data up in OneDrive. So this version of the Scribo integrates with Microsoft OneDrive. So um, this is a view of my OneDrive, and I've got this wonderfully named folder called my data set. And I've got some weird named files in here, which I know they're JPEGs because I put them in two hours ago. I have some cat photos because this is an internet presentation. I have plums, artichokes, and if you have a look closely, you'll see the kangaroo in my side yard. So I could package this up as a zip file and send it to each one of you, and it wouldn't be very useful, even if I told you this is my data set. So let's actually turn it into a data set using RO Crate. So first I'll log into Microsoft OneDrive. Here it is. So these are all of the folders in my top level OneDrive. Let's make that a bit bigger. Um, I, can, I can open these folders up and have a look and all of these are empty, but my data set, if we have a look, it's got some things in here. These are files, so these are not selectable because at this view here, what we wanna do is we wanna select a folder of things, of stuff that we, wanna, we want to describe. So I'm gonna select my data set. And what this is doing is it's had a look in that folder and it didn't find a file called rocratemetadata.json. That's what actually makes a folder of content an RO crate. So if I just go back for a minute, you'll notice there's this new file in here, rocratemetadata.json. And if I actually open, well, actually I won't open up, I'll make one change. The name of that crate is my research object crate. So I'm now I'm gonna call it photos of animals and plants at home, full stop. Now that's saved. Now let's have a look. If I open up that file and if this demo works, we should see, hopefully that's clear to everyone, there is a name property that says photos of animals and plants at home. Immediately, I've already made this content, this folder of data more useful to someone else. I can send it to them and they have this JSON link data file, which is in the RO crate, which is conforms to the RO crate specification. Um, and so here's the spec here, the, com the conformance line. This is some stuff the RO crate talks about that describes what's in this file. And this is the so-called root data set that has a name. Now, already I've made that data more useful. I can zip this file up and send it off to someone, but we can do more with this, okay? So firstly, I've got some data files in here. So let's actually describe those. I'm gonna pick out just one of them. 
that's been added. So now we have this file entity and by default, what it's done is it added, it added an entry into the crate and it gave it the same name as the file. Now that's not very useful. So let's have a look. Okay, we get a file preview. This one's cats. So let's change the name, cats. And let's put in, uh, let's add some properties to this. Let's add, let's say keywords. Now what's happened here, the profile that's built into Describo is based off schema.org. So what the application does, does is it says, for an entity of type file, what are all the properties that are relevant for that entity? And it goes and extracts all of those properties and that's what's coming up in this list. But it actually then walks the tree because file is the child of other entities. And these are entities all form a tree back up to a single root called thing. So all of these properties here are all of the things that schema.org says are relevant for an entity of type file. Now, automatically by adding a file, I get content size, I get encoding format, and I get date modified because that comes from our clone in the back end. So the data is available there. So Describo adds it in automatically. But let's add some keywords. One out of property keywords. In schema.org, keywords can be a URL, it can be a defined term or it can be raw text. So let's try raw text and I'm going to say cats and save that. And we have a look down here and we've got that, we've got cats. Actually, let me add some more keywords. I'll add a defined term in this case. Let's say um, lazy cats, which is an adequate description of my cats. Uh, let's see now. Oh, wrong spot. Lazy cats. I'm going to save. We we'll go back to the entity and now we have this lazy cats keyword in here. So if we just go back to the data set for a second, let's see if this is saved properly. I did find one quirk and I think I've ironed it out, but hey, live demos are always a time to check these things out. There it is. So we have my lazy cats in here. Okay. And it's and because it's linked data, it's linked back to the entity that's that, that's supposed to be there. So we can see that link up here. So let's go back and add some more information. Um, I don't think I want to add any more about that. I'll go back to the root data set. I should probably add myself as an author. So now the context is a data set. So if I add a property, the properties that I get here are all the properties that are relevant in the tree, which, which ends at data set. So I'm going to look for author because I know that is a property. Oh. Going to add an author in here. Now I can do two things. Schema.org says an author can be a person or it can be an organization. I'm going to add a person. I could go and create a new person here, but I can also look up any saved templates that I have. So um, if I'd already had a person defined in this data in this RO crate, they would have come up in the top part of this drop down. So I could actually say I want to create, you know, Peter Sefton as an editor, as an author of my data set, and then I can reuse that entry over and over and keep linking to it. But I can also go up to save templates, things that I've created in the past in other RO crates, then I've saved them for my own personal reuse. So I'm going to add myself back in. And now we have me as an author. And we have a look and there are some properties that I've already said about myself. I have my given name and my family name. So I can go through and I can keep documenting my data. So this is a release candidate. So there's a few things we still need to work on, but there should be now four entries. Let's go and make all of these a bit more relevant. So plums, save that and go back. What's this one? Artichokes. Okay. Let's add a keyword in this one. Add defined term, we'll create a new one. We'll call this one plant. Let's go back here. Let's have a look at these other defined terms. So if we now have a look, we actually find all the other defined terms that have been defined in here. So we had a defined term that we created before called lazy cats. So I could just go and add that one here. And now I have these two defined terms. So what I'm slowly doing is I'm going through and building up a view of my data. So here's the root data set. Here's it talking about all the parts. Here's the reference to the author entry. If we scroll a bit further down, we've got our lazy cats defined term, and it's actually related to two entities within this data set. We have uh, my entry, the author entry in here. 
And here's the other defined term. So as you can see, what we're doing here is we're slowly go, building up a, a description of this data. Now, in a normal, in a normal research case, um, you would probably, uh, you know, be doing, you know, a sequence of experiments. You would say uh, this experiment was with 100 mils of ethanol and that one was with 110 mils of ethanol and the next one was with 130 mils. Sorry, I'm a chemist by training. So 130 mils of ethanol and so on and so forth. So you wouldn't want to be doing all of this every single time. So what you can do is save this as a template. My experiment template. Now there is a limit to the number of entities that will let you save. The fact that it's enabled allows it. So if I go to manage my templates now, we'll see this my experiment template. And that is uh, uh, an immutable version of all of the data that I've just created without the, with all of the things that make sense in, in the context of it being a template. So I can then come along and go back to my crate and say, you know what, this is, um, I don't like any of this. Let's get rid of all of these things. They're no good. Let's unlink all of these things here. They still, all I did was unlink them at that point, but let's actually delete them. So they should be gone. And so pretend that I've just loaded up this crate for the first time and it's brand new. And I don't want to start documenting it from scratch. Now let's apply this guy here. Give it a second. And there it is, it's restored all of my data from that template. So what I can do with the Scribo is I can sit there and generate templates for the different types of experiments I'm doing. Now, I, I, I'm betting that a lot of you are looking at this and thinking to yourself, wow, could the machine actually create some of this for you? And the answer is absolutely yes. I'm sorry, go back to this. Absolutely yes. There's a lot of this information that you could, you could write from Scribo or from elsewhere into the content folders. So when the user loads up their folder, they don't see a blank screen, they actually see an author list that they can mix and match. They see um, all of the experiment details, you know, to use the CERN physics example, you might have all of the data about the machine run that, that's already pre-written into the RO crate file. And the user then just has to focus on adding the bits of information that describe the things they did to the data when they started working on it. So I think that's probably a good place to stop because I don't want to keep you all from coffee. Um, I might hand over back to Guido and then see if anyone's got any questions. Yeah, fabulously. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for the demo and as you say, questions. Realising that questions are between yourselves and coffee. <laughs> going once, going twice. Thank you very much, Marco, for staying up late. I hope everybody's there, so I will start. Um, yeah, I will give you a very short glimpse of what we are doing in Task 4.3. It uh, deals with collaborative document editing. And from my point of view, at least, uh, one of the most used features, for example, of Google Drive is the Google Docs application. So people not only want to share documents, which is a very important use case, but they also want to edit it collaboratively. For example, when you work in big uh, projects like in Science Mesh, you uh, work with people from other institutions and therefore you have to edit uh, documents um, with your colleagues together. And in this uh, task here, we try to identify the main uh, types of documents and candidates uh, to be implemented into the EFSS solutions that can be coupled via the IOP. And we dealt here with some questions or have still to deal like uh, the licensing thing, how to um, yeah, integrate them into the solutions, um, which focuses on the protocols there and implementations into the FSS solutions. The main types of documents we are working with are uh, LibreOffice and Markdown, MS Office, diagrams and LaTeX documents. For LibreOffice, um, there was a Collabora available and implementation has already finished. For Markdown, um, there was the CodeMD solutions. Here were some other candidates, but this uh, sounds uh, to be the best candidate here to implement it because it's an open source solution and uh, supported by the vendor. Implementation has already finished. 
since uh, we have very little time here, I won't show a demonstration here, but we have uh, one prepared. So if you want to see this, please ask us in the Q&A session afterwards for a demonstration of uh, the Collabora and CodeEMD implementation. Only Office is another important candidate which has not been implemented yet because um, the um, protocol we use for the first to mention products is Wopi and um, it's currently uh, at least not a part of Only Office, but we are hoping to get the job done here together with them and to um, present a working solution somewhere in the future. Droyo is the candidate of our choice for editing diagrams. Um, implementation here is possible, but there will probably be no collaborative mode. But in this special case, we think that it's not uh, heavily needed. So we will probably uh, let it uh, uh, stay this way. Um, for LaTeX, um, there was one big candidate to be integrated um, in uh, the EFSS that is Overleaf. It's um, a well-established online editor for LaTeX documents, but unfortunately, currently there was no implementation in the sync and share solutions, but um, this will be one of our next tasks to have a look at it. What can be done here? Should we do it? Uh, should we ask the vendor for help? Um, that's currently an open task for us. The next step, therefore, will be to work on the Overleaf implementation. I think quite an important thing. And even more important, um, further uh, talk to only Office and see what is necessary to implement uh, this one um, um, in Science Mesh, because as we saw in some presentations earlier this week, MS Office documents are probably make 90% or something out of the document stored uh, in the typical um, sync and share solution. Uh, I did not talk about note-taking tools. Um, this is something we also want to have a look at in the near future. Um, CERN uh, uses Joplin for this, and this might be a candidate for Science Mesh too. Um, we are already also open for other candidates of um, document editors. So if you have something you want to see implemented here, please ask us and we will see what you can, what we can do here. And um, yes, also one of the next steps, maybe not in the near future, but a little bit later um, is the evalu evaluation of the work we have done so far with the help of selected friendly users. Um, we already identified some work groups that might be able to help us and um, yeah, play around with the things we did so far. But I think um, some uh, work in implementation has to be done here until we can start this. And another task we identified that is um, yeah, an open task right now is uh, the licensing question because with the implementations um, we created here it will be possible to use um, the editors um, in your solution that are hosted at other solutions so in the future it might be possible or it will be possible to um, open um, some kind of office document on um, let's say the University of Münster's own cloud and to use CERN's um, collaborator, Collabora um, editor for this. But uh, yeah, um, what about licensing here? If you have concurrent licenses, no problem. If you paid for potential users, then we run into problems we still have to solve. Okay, and that's so far everything from my side said, please ask us for a live demonstration if you want some. Thank you. Thank you, Holger. Uh, thank you for your present short presentation. So the last remaining, uh, last but not least, the remaining topics for uh, this session, uh, this, uh, this part of the session is uh, our own uh, trumpet presentation on demand data transfer stuff. So Ron, are you ready to share slides? Yes, I am. Thank you. Thanks much. Go on. Okay.
Let me see, where do I have it? Ah, there it is. That's what you call the apocalypse. <clears throat> okay, well, uh, here I'm back again, everybody. This is uh, a very short presentation on the on the science mesh for on demand uh, data transfers. <clears throat> so, uh, why on demand data transfers? Well, so there are a number of use cases where uh, data locality is an important thing. For instance, if somebody has a data set of something like 50 or 100 terabytes or so, and you want to do some uh, high throughput data processing on it, then you can, uh, you can, uh, sorry for the background noise, but um, you can, uh, let's say, share the data, but if these 100 terabytes uh, has to uh, be drawn across the, the network for a couple of times, it, it may be uh, very cumbersome. So that's why it's good if you have the ability on within sync and share services to do copy data sets uh, elsewhere. Uh, and particularly you would uh, think that this uh, would be valid for the, the more larger data sets. Uh, so that's what we've already talked about, support data transfers between uh, enterprise sync and share services, what we've implemented so far. And it also is a data transfer mechanism agnostic. So. And what that uh, actually means, uh, I will show you here. Here you have uh, two uh, EFSS systems, the IOP running with several microservices and related to the, the data transfers, there are basically two different services that uh, are running in that. Uh, that's a, a data transfer service uh, that is actually managing the whole thing uh, like keeping track of uh, data transfers and, uh, and invoking a thing called a data transfer driver. Uh, the data transfer driver is uh, something that can be specific to uh, a certain type of transfer or certain transfer mechanism, but uh, the data transfer service, transfer service itself is um, it's a transfer mechanism agnostic. So, yeah, basically what we see here is uh, the transfer request, the invitation workflow we discussed earlier, and, uh, and the driver uh, that invokes the transfer and the actual transfer itself. So, basically that is what the, the, the service does. It, uh, it transfers, uh, does the transfer request, uh, get uh, the service also gets transfer statuses and also allows you to cancel a transfer and the driver itself uh, does the, the real heavy lifting. Uh, for now, we have implemented the R clone mechanism, you may all well know. And, uh, but in the future, uh, we're also uh, taking into consideration to interact with uh, Rusio, the data management uh, platform used by high energy physics and now also also by astronomy and uh, FDS, the file transfer service and file sender. So, so basically this is the workflow that uh, we envisage uh, for a data transfers using an FDS. So where does this data transfer driver, um, let's say, uh, all, uh, contains an FTS client to submit data transfers to an FTS, which is uh, some sort of a batch scheduler for data transfers. And to keep anything short, we've prepared a very short video uh, for you. So let me see if I can find it. And there it is. And here I'm going to show it to you. So I hope you can see all this. Yes. Okay. But I think it's stopped. Oh, oh dear. You should, you should, but I think you have to play. You have to press the play. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. So there's no sound here, but here there is uh, a, tra a create transfer that's being done. 
so that uh, a small file is going to be transferred from uh, from one person to another. So then you have the the the, the let's say the access acceptance workflow that the transfer is accepted uh, by the target user, and which is similar to accepting a file transfer. So, we got a transfer ID, so we can uh, see if the transfer has completed and that has happened in the meantime. So now we go to the target user. and has a look what's uh, in the sync share system. And there we see that the, the file has been uploaded or has been transferred between two sync share systems. Uh, in the meantime, also a console a transfer uh, has been implemented. And again, we create a, a transfer, but this time of, of a big file. So transfer has been accepted and now we see that the transfer is in progress. And now we uh, re regret our decision to, uh, to transfer the file and we want to cancel it. And then uh, the transfer has been canceled. Then we can get the status and then you see that the transfer really has been canceled. So, and that's, uh, that's all from me. Okay, thank you. Are any questions? An immediate question to that part. Uh, if not, let's let's make the questions and answers uh, at the end. Uh, let me just. Uh, so what, there are two raised hands, Maci. Oh, sorry, I didn't notice. Uh, how do you see them? There's uh, Marcel. Okay, so and yeah. Alan. Let's start with Marcel then. Okay, um, so that might be a dumb question, but uh, how does what is the difference between this file transfer and the first demo we've seen today? Uh, yeah, the, the first demo uh, that is just the, um, the the invitation workflow to to establish a trust relationship between the one the the person that wants to share a file, share an application. Um, let's say uh, do a data transfer and the person that accepts it. So this, this actually precedes this. So first you have the trust relationship and then you can share data, uh, share data transfers, share applications. So that's ah, basically thanks. it. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay, the second question. Hello, um, my question is about Uploading data from things like Google Drive and Dropbox, what should be used for that? That's a very good question. Well, uh, let's say the the, the uh, also internally in the team we are also having a, we were having a discussions on this uh, this item. Uh, then you probably need something in the middle. I mean, enterprise uh, EFSS systems uh, support at the moment web dev so you need some kind of a gateway at the moment to uh, let's say to to transfer data from google drive or onedrive into into the mesh okay so there isn't at the moment a preferred solution so you mean uh, to to some kind of a prepared solution to ingest yeah. uh, data into the mesh or to export data from the mesh that's what yeah. you mean uh, at the moment, not yet, no. Okay, thank you. I just want to, to comment, uh, while we are working on a technical solution for this, I think we already have a policy in place. It's going to be completely for free. <laughs> I have one, one comment on top of the presentation that Ron just uh, screened. 
is that uh, um, while we are using Arclon for using web to web transfers, uh, Arclon has already built in support to connect to other clouds like OneDrive, etc. We have not exercised that, uh, but uh, I think that's in the also in the in the plan to try to connect to other clouds. As Arclon has multiple plugins already built in, and we rely on it. Yeah, indeed. Uh, our clone is some sort of a Swiss army knife to con uh, connect to cloud storages. Okay. So, thank you, Ron, for a presentation on demand data transfers. And uh, now I'll try to summarize a little bit what we've seen and um, propose a short discussion. So uh, we, we can see that in uh, different applications areas, we are making progress along the lines which uh, I mentioned on the, on the beginning. So from one hand, we're doing the, um, let's say integration of, um, we enabling the integration of particular applications with the signature in general. Uh, and uh, we've got some kind of uh, progress uh, and additional features related to, to that. And in addition, we're uh, enabling the cross-site collaboration and several cases, we are quite advanced on that. So in uh, the space of distributed data science environments, you can see that we've got uh, this uh, basic or most popular tools covered like JupyterLab, three nearly. Nearly we're working on OnCloud and NextCloud. And uh, this, this, this status is that we are uh, partially using this. Uh, I mean, we're mostly using this for testing and you, but you, on the other hand, you can see code on GitHub. So if you're interested, you can review it or, or involve into the process. For open data systems, we have uh, we have we're working on uh, the tools we mentioned uh, uh, during the presentation. So, Rockrate, the environment is Skibo, uh, where we we're testing this and we target to run it. Uh, so, the status is that we the standalone tools exist, as you could see on the uh, demo. But we're working on integrating the uh, um, Rockrate related stuff with the sync and share environment. Uh, on collaborative documents, you, there, was, there are already some uh, some of the products are already uh, usable. Um, I mean, they're put into production like Collabora and CodeMD integration. For the draw over and overleaf, we're still thinking, as you said, as you heard, only office would be a very attractive thing, but we we still need uh, to figure out how to do these things because the, there's quite a substantial uh, chunk of work needed to to uh, integrate only office. And on the on-demand data, trans data transfer, you just seen that we're uh, we're uh, uh, working mostly on uh, on Arcon, and while we also have some other tools on the radar, and we're mostly in testing phase, and part of the code can be found on the GitHub. So now the question comes because this. So until now, we kind of presented what we what we, what we have done for uh, the application uh, uh, and these cases integration with uh, the mesh with the sync share stuff. And now uh, I'd like to touch for a while on how we would like you to help. I mean, of course, of course, we've got our our agenda in uh, and work plan uh, determined somehow by the uh, by the project plan. However, we 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 actually we're actually working also for uh, we we're working to uh, address the use cases of end users. At the end, sync and share stuff we run for the end users. So. If you have, as Holger, point, Holger pointed already, uh, if we if you have the application in mind, which should be somehow, uh, which is of necessity of your users, and if it could be also a kind of buying factor for uh, your future users, or enables you to go for higher scale or uh, let's say address new uh, new uh, use cases. We would be happy to hear for, hear about it from you. In some cases, uh, of, of course, this would be too much work to work, uh, to 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 adopt to, to, to your needs. However, uh, in some cases, we could we could uh, try to uh, do these things. We could also try to do things together. Uh, you can also propose a use case because we we didn't talk too much about this today because uh, we mostly focus on the technical outcomes of what we were doing. However. These things are not detached from the use cases we're, we're, we're working on. For instance, the data science stuff is mostly, it's quite related to work done at CERN and also work, uh, work done on earth, earth observation and things like that. So if you have new use case and there will be some special um, uh, requirements or functionality requests, let's say, 
resulting from the specific uh, uh, requirements of your use case, we would be interested also to hear, hear that. You can involve in testing, uh, as it was also signal, signalized already, uh, it would be great to have an friendly testers of what you're doing. Of course, we're doing some kind of uh, testing wherever possible. However, the more a uh, pair of eyes looks at things, as you know, it's better. So if you're interested, please contact us. I will also uh, display the contact information to the authors of today's talks and task leaders at the end. And uh, I, th I think I should also say that we're ha happy if, if someone wants to join the development. Uh, part of code is already available in GitHub. Uh, I mean, for some items discussed today. So if you're interested not only in, uh, to be involved, not only in testing, but also in, in, uh, in other ways of collaboration, we, we're very open. Uh, so these are contact information to the uh, task uh, leaders and also those who actually gave presentation today. Uh, so you can copy it from, uh, from the presentation if you like. Uh, and I think now it's time for questions. So maybe in the interest of time, the maybe we can uh, unless there are some immediate questions but some questions were already asked on the chat okay let's maybe take one question because uh, we have we are running a bit late so we have a question from bob yeah thanks very much for the presentations they're all very useful and give a good good idea of of the of the um, interesting developments that are ongoing which will expand sort of the tool set um since you mentioned early adopters and testers and so on, um, is there a mechanism in the mesh at the moment so that a user who is not attached to a mesh site could actually start using some of the tools and get experience with it and then potentially um, convince their home institute to join the mesh? So who would like to answer that? I would say that uh, such a mechanism has to be put in place. But it's definitely to uh, in our plans to, to uh, on, the, on our radar to look at uh, homeless users and how we can accommodate those. Yeah. The possibility could be a public provider. Just having a public <coughs> provider which provides uh, uh, accounts with a small quota, but basically open to. Yeah, at surf we, we, we yeah at surf we allow for for such users, okay. so that any one of those sites can can take those on board. Yeah, the, the those that would be a good suggestion. Limited limited uh, quota, limited duration, something like that. I think would help. Uh, encourage more people to pick up, make use of your uh, of your mesh. Thank you very much, Bob, for this comment. Maciej, can I take the mic from you because we have to move on now? 